Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. I am honored today to introduce the Lasker APSA lecturer. Because at the Lasker Foundation, we are dedicated to improving health by ensuring support for medical research. It's only through scientific discovery that we will achieve our vision of better health for all. And today's speaker, Dr. Napoleon Ferrara, is an inspiring role model for science who I believe epitomizes the good that medical research can do. Now this audience knows well that Dr. Ferrara discovered vascular endothelial growth factor, lovingly known as VEGF, a major mediator of angiogenesis. He went on, of course, to develop anti-VEGF therapies to treat cancer and eye diseases, truly revolutionizing the treatment of wet macular degeneration, a leading cause of blindness in the elderly. We were pleased to recognize Dr. Ferrara with the 2010 Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award for his discovery of VEGF and the development of effective anti-VEGF therapy for wet macular degeneration. And today, we're very proud to partner with the American Physician Scientist Association to present this lecture as a way to celebrate the MD, PhD students in attendance who have embraced careers in medical research. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome our lecturer, distinguished professor of pathology at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, Dr. Napoleon Ferrara. Okay. Thank you so much for this uh, very kind introduction. It's a great honor for me to be here to give this lecture, actually. I, uh, even though I've not really seen patients for decades, actually, I do full-time research, but I still I feel a physician scientist because I'm, I'm, at this, my medical background has been extremely useful for me, actually, at least to, to address you know, some, some physiologically important questions. I've been fortunate to work in this uh, really beautiful field, which is angiogenesis. Actually, it's mostly associated with the tumor angiogenesis, with tumorigenesis. This is one of the earliest experiments. Actually, this field has its root you know, in some, some extremely elegant experimental work done in the 30s and in the 40s. Actually, at that time, you know, the discovery of the transparent chamber, which actually is the prototype of intravital microscopy, was really uh, instrumental for this discovery. This is a tumor which actually was introduced in one of those chambers. You can see this, the tumor is in the middle, and you see this growth of vessels, you know, grow radially toward, you know, the tumor. And this early investigator, I was actually a group at University of Rochester, made this observation that the tumor must be producing, must be elaborating some blood vessel growth, you know, stimulating substance. You know, at the time, it certainly was a, an extremely insightful idea. But of course, you know, the biochemical and molecular tool to advance the, this idea simply did not exist, you know. And certainly we need, you know, to uh, owe a, uh, I mean, uh, uh, lots of credit you know, to Judah Falkman, who in the early 70s was certainly the first one who appreciated you know, the therapeutic and, and translational implication of all this work. You know. And uh, as, uh, he proposed that anti angiogenesis could represent you know, a therapy you know, for, for cancer as well as a, as a mother disease. You know. But of course, you know, uh, uh, translating this idea was predicated upon you know, making some fundamental discovery, identify the mediators of angiogenesis that you could you know, potentially block. You know, you could potentially inhibit you know, their activity. And already in the 80s, you know, around the day, there were, there were a, a number of factors were discovered, were characterized as an angiogenic factor, like member of the you know, EGF you know, family, FGF family, as well as several others. It became clear that even though this molecule could potently promote angiogenesis in a number of bioassays, but when you, one tried to block you know, them, very little happened. So something really, it seems that something was missing from, from this picture, naturally. I was very, actually, it was a very fortunate to give a contribution to this field. Actually, I was working on a, a somewhat of a different field. When I was a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF, I was working you know, in the Reproductive Endocrinology Center. Actually, my project at the time was you know, to study some poorly known cells in the pituitary called follicular stellate cells, which don't produce any, uh, any classical hormones. And I, I observed that these cells release you know, some mitogenic activity you know, for endothelial cells. You know. At the time, it seems to be a relatively unremarkable observation because the people thought that you know, FGF and all these other factors could be important. My, my gut feeling was that this could be something different because it was a secreting you know, molecule, unlike you know, FGF. 
And so actually I did some initial characterization when I was at UCSF and then when I joined Genentech, I was very fortunate to find this in incredible you know, technology, fa fantastic you know, place. Actually within six months after I joined Genentech, we were able you know, to have an terminal sequence of this protein actually. Those were the days when you know, the discovery process was very different, yet you know, to purify the protein, you know, sequence which you could take a very long time and based on the sequence design some probes you know, to, to, to screen CD in a library in clone, which all over the world could be extremely challenging. But we're very fortunate we're able to isolate the uh, with sequence of VEGF and clone. You know, actually, uh, uh, I'm going to go in the, the fine details, but the point is that the bovine and human VEGF, and actually, which are uh, illustrating A and B, had over 90% identity, which suggests that this was a very conserved you know, molecule. In the study, we isolate, actually, we identify three different isoform of VEGF, which are different, you know, in, in, in terms of in the amino acid you know, length, you know, but they have a very similar biological activity. You know, actually, after several years, actually, we, uh, we, we learned a lot, quite a bit about, you know, the, the, the way VEGF, you know, works, actually. We, 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 we discovered, based on work by, done by many laboratories uh, all over the world, you know, that, you know, VEGF is uh, uh, the original VEGF, which is called VEGFA, is the prototype member of a gene family. We also include other molecules, like, you know, PLGF, you know, VEGF, you know, B, VEGF, you know, C and D. And there are two main tyrosine kinase, you know, receptors, which, uh, uh, which bind, you know, VEGF, you know, which is called, they're called VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. It is, as you can see, these are two highly conserved, you know, tyrosine kinase, which have, you know, seven immunoglobulin-like domain in the extracellular portion, actually. Now it's very well accepted, you know, the VEGF receptor 2 is the main uh, receptor which is transmitting you know, the signal, mitogenic, you know, uh, angiogenic, and even mediate another important activity of inducing vascular permeability, which actually was initially identified by Harold you know, Dvorak. You know. But what is interesting, the VEGF receptor 1, even though its biological activity is less clearly defined, is still after two decades, is still relatively controversial, it's a very interesting property. It binds you know, VEGF with extremely high binding affinity. Actually, you can see this red you know, spot here, which uh, correspond to the second IG-like domain. This is what we, at the time we discovered that we characterized this as the key binding elements you know, for VEGF. You know. and actually, this structural information has been instrumental to design a class of inhibitor like a soluble receptor. And uh, clearly, uh, 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 before going to translation, it was a very important to understand what kind of molecule VEGF is, what it does. You know. uh, uh, an effective translation probably requires some, some, some basic understanding. It is actually of the many experiments that we illustrate, you know, the physiology, the, the physiological importance of VEGF, actually. I can, uh, still, after almost you know, two decades, I cannot do much better than showing you know, the, this experiment, which is the knockout of VEGF in mice. And show even uh, uh, loss of a single allele, you know, in the result in embryonic lethality. And you, you, see, you can see this is the wild type embryo. Uh, we, 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 we have a very nicely developed embryo, for, and the blood lines, blood islands are well vascularized. Instead, you know, the mutant, which lacks only one allele, there is still 50% of EGF, you know. You can see there is hardly see any blood vessels, you know, and the embryo is severely, severely underdeveloped, probably already, you know, dead, you know. So this is one of the very, f uh, an example of very few genes which are so critical, even, you know, partial inactivation result in embryonic lethality. You know. and, uh, and, and, and this is a certainly is a, um, is, is a, is a critical role in vascular development, is a major f in, in, uh, role of EGF, as well as a many other role in physiology, which actually we don't have the time to go in, in the detail. But what is the, today's topic is what is the therapeutic application of EGF. This slide is illustrated you know, the VEGF you know, signaling pathway. It, multiple inhibitors which can be have been designed you know, be, uh, uh, to block you know, VEGF. You know. Uh, once again, you know, VEGF, you know, uh, uh, the, the VEGF you know, ligand can be a major target by itself. And most you know, the VEGF you know, receptor, there are, for example, antibody to VEGF receptor 2. There is a soluble receptor which is called v, the VEGF you know, trap. You know. And there is, of course, you know, multiple kinase inhibitor uh, uh, which inhibits you know, VEGF you know, signaling. But, you know, this inhibitors are typically quite promiscuous because they inhibit also uh, related and even unrelated you know, uh, uh, tyrosine kinase, including you know, PDGF, you know, uh, CKIT, you know, and probably many others. You know. and, and, um, 
the, uh, this is also very, in, in, in all the understanding, which actually was published, I would say, 21 years ago. But still, I would like to repropose it because this was really initiating you know, the idea that you know, targeting of EEGF you know, for cancer therapy could have some beneficial effect. In this early study, actually, this was uh, probably the earliest in vivo study you know, uh, to probe you know, the role of EEGF. At that time, we did not have yet you know, genetic data like knockout. But we developed some, some good you know, neutralizing antibody, an antibody called A461, using human VEGF as an antigen, actually. This antibody is species specific, so only blocks you know, human VEGF, so it does not really account for the contribution of endogenous VEGF. But still, you, as, uh, in spite of this, you know, you, you, uh, by giving this antibody to tumor-bearing mice result in a, in a very substantial inhibition of the tumor growth. You know. In some tumor model, there is over 90% inhibition. Which at that time, this was a very striking result because it was widely believed that tumor angiogenesis is a multifactorial process. So you need to block you know, maybe 10 or, or more different angiogenic factors to achieve that. But this experiment suggests that this was not you know, the case. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, the, uh, the, there was a long way to go before, before reaching the clinic, actually. This experiment were extended, replicated in, in a number of laboratories with a variety of reagents and as well in, in, in several models. But eventually we conclude, you know, that actually that, you know, blocking of EEGF, you know, could have some therapeutic value in humans, you know. And there is, of course, a multiple way to accomplish that. I will see, we'll see in a moment. But what we did at that time, you know, we decided to, to humanize the murine antibody, which I show you in the previous slides. You know. This was a, an, an, an antibody which is a good binding affinity for VEGF, but not you know, super high. And this is probably to turn out to be a very important characteristic. You know. and the, and the, and this humanized antibody, which is called Bevacizumab, retains most of the characteristic of the murine antibody. In that, you know, it's species specific, you know, and, and, and also very important is able to block, you know, all the isoform of VEGF as well as VEGF can be proteolytic acclivity within the tumor microenvironment, you know, by protease like MMPs or, or plasmin. And, and this antibody neutralizes even all the biologically active fragments. And this antibody started a clinical trial now a long time ago, actually, in, in 1997, actually. At that time, there was a lots of, you know, controversy, lots of confusion about, you know, the tumor angiogenesis field, you know. There, was a, there have been a number of extremely promising, you know, uh, uh, findings with the, uh, certain inhibitors, especially fragment of proteins, you know, which were, at the time generated a great deal of excitement. But then a number of clinical trials were negative, and so actually when this uh, finding was uh, uh, actually presented at ASCO in 2003, actually was uh, extremely surprised. It was a very pleasant surprise. In, in, this was uh, the, f the first you know, definitive you know, phase three study proving that, you know, uh, testing, proving the hypothesis that blocking angiogenesis with a VEGF inhibitor can actually have a beneficial effect in humans. You know. Actually, there was in, in patients with you know, metastatic colorectal cancer, actually, which uh, were treated even with the chemotherapy alone, which was IFL, irinotecan, 5-FU, and leucovorin. Or with IFL plus bevacizumab, you know, and, and, and given this, this antibody result in a survival benefit, which was about, you know, four to five, uh, to five months, you know, actually. And this was at that time the longest, you know, survival benefit conferred by a single agent. And there's an important point to make about the studies. One, perhaps one of the principal personalized medicine is that you treat your drug, you treat your, uh, 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 only the responsive patient population, provided you have a biomarker. In this case, there was not a biomarker. There is not one as yet, you know. And so it, this trial was done in all commerce. All patients were treated, you know. And still, it was possible to demonstrate a survival benefit, which would have been extremely difficult, even with receptin, if you had treated, you know, all patients with breast cancer without, you know, selection for ER2. And so after um, over a decade, you know, this, this drug still represents a standard of therapy for colon cancer across, you know, multiple lines of therapy. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, overwhelm you with clinical data. I would like to make one uh, show, one study, which I think it makes a very important biological point, which was actually predicted you know, by the, by the preclinical data. 
the importance of the duration of the therapy. It's almost too intuitive that if you want you know, to block angiogenesis, actually to have a beneficial effect, you need to block you know, on a long-term basis for a very simple reason that, you know, unless you withhold you inhibit that the tumor is going to be revascularized, you know, and your ter therapy is going to be less effective. It is a trial in, in patients of ovarian cancer essentially illustrated you know, this point, prove this point, you know. This is patients with, after, you know, surgery, we randomize in three groups, you know. One which received only the chemotherapy, which was given for this, you know, duration of a, a few weeks, you know. The second group received, you know, chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, which was given only during this very uh, 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 coincident with the chemotherapy. And then the third group, which received chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, which was then given as a single agent, you know, for up to 15, 15 months. You can immediately see that the group which received the greatest, you know, benefit, you know, in terms of progression-free survival was, you know, the group which received the maintenance therapy. And this may seem a very simple concept at that time, but there was actually a lot of a controversy in the field because there is an hypothesis which uh, postulated that uh, what you need, you know, to do is simply give it the chemotherapy in conjunction with, you know, an, an anti-angiogenic vessel such that you normalize the vessels and this is what you, what you need to do. Instead of this data suggests it's also not only important, you know, to, to uh, normalize the vessels in giving chemotherapy, but, but the the continuity, the duration of the therapy is really is very critical. And I'd like to actually to stay within you know, the gynecological sphere, I would like to show some very recent piece of clinical data, which I think at least to me are very, very exciting. Actually, I started my career in reproductive endocrinology and, 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 and gynecology. Uh, cervical cancer is one of the, the tumors which has been historically associated with angiogenesis. You can see this is a colposcopy. You see all these uh, lots of vessels which are uh, frequently very atypical, you know. And in, in, in a group at NCI actually conducted a phase three trial in actually testing the hypothesis that block, you know, angiogenesis with the bevacizumab result, you know, in a, in a, in a benefit, you know, to patients. And the study has, has been published just a few, a few weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. It showed that actually uh, 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 showed increase, you know, survival in patients with the cervical cancer, you know, treated with the bevacizumab with two different, you know, chemotherapy regimens. It is representing, you know, the first, you know, bi biological agent which result, you know, in increasing or surviving in cervical cancer. It could be, I believe, potentially very important. And of course, you know, uh, uh, we, we, there is a multiple way to inhibit you know, VEGF, as I, I was alluding at the beginning. You know, there is a, and not only bevacizumab, which has been approved for multiple cancers, but there is other drug. You know, there is a series of kinase inhibitors, like, you know, sunitinib, sorafenib, and others, you know. But there is also protein VEGF inhibitor, for example, when one is a flibercept, you know, or the VEGF, you know, trap, which is, has been approved, you know, in second-line colon cancer. And so very intriguing that also with an antibody to VEGF receptor 2, which has been developed, you know, by Eli Lilly uh, company, which uh, even though it's not been approved yet, you know, it shows some very intriguing you know, survival benefit in gastric cancer as well as in second line, you know, lung, you know, cancer, at least as, as, as assessed by press release. And so there is a multiple inhib VEGF inhibitor. As of today, to my knowledge, there are uh, 10 different VEGF, you know, pathway inhibitor, which has been approved, you know, for therapy for cancer or for other set of disease, which is also very important for eye disease, intraocular neovascular disease. So w w what remains to be done next, you know, it's, it's very obvious that, you know, patients even treated with the VEGF inhibitor, actually, they eventually progress, and actually, and, and, and actually this lies, you know, actually emphasize one, one very obvious, you know, problem with cancer therapy, which is the onset of drug resistance, you know, actually, this does not apply to VEGF inhibitor, actually, this applies to is a very exciting drug in personalized, you know, therapy, which is Zelboraf, which is a uh, which is a BRAF in inhibitor, which, which uh, targets patients, which treat you know, patients with the melanoma, which are about 600 you know, BRAF, you know. And this shows that how this drug is a, an, an incredibly dramatic effect, almost a miraculous effect, you know, in this targeted population. Actually, after a few weeks of treatment, you know, this lesion seems to be, seems to be gone. But unfortunately, almost inevitably, after this, several weeks later, actually, this lesion recurred almost exactly in the same place. It, it, it is essentially show that the drug resistor can curtail the benefit you know, of a target, you know, therapy. You can 
can make uh, many other examples, actually, with other, you know, uh, therapy which target oncogenes. It's obvious that, you know, VEG, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a resistance, you know, uh, with, with the VEGF inhibitor, patients progress. But I think there is a very significant, you know, difference, you know, very significant mechanistic, you know, difference, which is illustrated in this, in this study. Let me explain what it is. This is the TML study, which actually shows that, you know, uh, which, uh, what they did, you know, they, they patients with, with treating, you know, with the colon cancer, we treat it with the bevacizumab with and without the chemotherapy. A patient after progression, you know, it, so it will be a situation where you expect, you know, any, the same therapy will be futile. They were randomized again in plus with and without, you know, bevacizumab. And yet there was a survival benefit there were in, in, in this patient population, which seems to be totally counterintuitive. It is certainly suggested the mechanism of the resistance is fundamentally different. Actually, it's suggesting some level of plasticity, you know, some level of you know, reversibility, you know, which actually evoke you know, an, an important system, which is the tumor microenvironment. Naturally, the study was published you know, last year. Naturally. Our, our lab, as well as many other labs, have been working on this idea, have been actually speculating this could be important you now for a number of years, actually. For the last you know, several years, since in maybe 2006 and 2007, we've been testing the idea that actually the tumor microenvironment could be a mediator of, you know, inherent or acquired resistance to anti-angiogenic agent, you know, actually. And uh, th th this uh, cartoon illustrates in a highly reductionist way, actually, what the mechanism which operated within the tumor microenvironment. But what we've been particularly interested in was the idea that bone marrow cells actually could play a role in this phenomenon. And actually, in, in this early experiment, what we did, we identified some cell line we show either a high level of responsiveness to, to VEGF, to uh, anti-VEGF, like, you know, these two cell lines, TAB6 and B16F1. Or the uh, uh, cell line will show a much less degree of response, which is like the Lewis line carcinoma in the EL4, actually. I should say that to do this experiment, we utilize a completely different set of reagents because an antibody like bevacizumab, which is uh, species specific, would not be useful in the study, which was done in immunocompetent host. You know. it, for us, it was very important to be able to do this experiment in immuno, in, in a, in, with an intact immune system. And actually, what we did, you know, in, in uh, our experimental system was to transplant, you know, bone marrow from a GFP, GFP transgenic mice into a literally radiating host, you know, and, the, and, and then implant, you know, the same cell line into this, uh, into this chimeric, uh, in, uh, into this chimeric host, you know. And, uh, and, and as you can immediately notice that, you know, the, the, uh, the tumor section from animals which harbor, you know, the resistant tumors are, is uh, very heavily infiltrated, you know, by green cells, by bone marrow derived cells. Instead, you know, the, 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 the sensitive tumors like the TIB6 and the BS, B16F1, with and without anti-VEGF, very few of these elements, you know. So which very clearly suggests that there is infiltration of, of bone marrow cells, which at least, you know, correlated with this resistor. At the time, this work was done in a rather unbiased way. At the time, there was an hypothesis very prevalent in vascular biology that you have some a sort of stem cells, you know, called endothelial progenitor cells, which can home, you know, and be incorporated in, in, the, in the growing vessel wall. And they could be potentially less responsive to regulators of angiogenesis. But, and I say we found that no evidence of that because we found that all of the all of this, you know, green cells, they had a very perivascular organization. They were much more consistent. Actually, we identified these cells as, as being CD11B, GR1, myeloid cells, which are now it's very well known as a broad you know, population which include uh, neutrophils, macrophage, and dendritic cells, as well as uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells which inhibit, you know, T cell mediating you know, responses. And uh, we're able to show actually these cells, you know, uh, play an active role in this resistance. We're able to show that, you know, co-inject, you know, cd 11 bgr one cells for animals which harbor, you know, the resistant tumors is sufficient to impart, you know, resistant to VEGF inhibitor. And actually, we're able to work out a pathway, actually. Uh, 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 the, actually, this work has been published several years ago. Since time is limited, I will just, you know, summarize what we found. There is a communication between the tumor and the bone marrow, which is, seems to be, at least in this model, primarily mediated by the major myeloid you know, growth factor, you know, GCSF, you know, GCSF, which is produced by tumor cells as well as by the stroma. 
which actually uh, uh, act on uh, uh, um, immature myeloid you know, progenitors, which result in expansion, and also result in actually in a regulation of specific angiogenic factor. Like there is, a, in particular, a molecule which our lab has been characterized as being actually in a, 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 both you know, hematopoietic and angiogenic, which is called BV8. You know, this molecule is a small protein with a molecular weight of 10,000, which, which interact with the two I-related you know, GPCRs. But results in similar effect as the VEGF, you know, induced angiogenesis, actually in, so can, can also amplify uh, myeloid cells mobilization induced by GCSF. You know. And actually this induction is exquisitely statinotreat dependent, you know. And, uh, and actually, the, this is the consequence of blocking you know, this, uh, this, this protein of B BV8 in tumors. Actually, this is a micro CT angiography of uh, this happened to be a colorectal cancer. You know, uh, 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 in response to anti VEGF, there is, as, as expected, a reduction in blood you know, vessel density. You know. and, and, there is a, and there is also a reduction, even though perhaps of a lesser extent, you know, in the group you know, treated with anti BV8. So, and, and actually, as one would expect, you know, GCSF you know, being the driver actually, if you block you know, GCSF, you uh, essentially phenocopy this effect. Actually, in general, the magnitude is, is a slight higher than that you know, anti you know, BV8, you know, which actually il would illustrate you know, how critical this system is. And actually, in, uh, in this, as well as in many other studies, which are a bit, would take too long you know, to summarize, we've been convinced that GCSF could be an important endogenous mediator. Actually, it's very well known you know, to many clinicians that. You know, Know, there is a number of paraneoplastic you know, syndrome, you know, which is uh, characterized by extensive extreme leukocytosis. In some cases, it can, can give rise to so-called you know, leukemoid you know, reaction. Actually, uh, they are mostly associated with lung you know, cancer, with the bladder cancer, as well as with some breast you know, cancer. Uh, there is an excessive endogenous production of a GCSF. And so we're interested in elucidating you know, the signaling path which uh, results in upregulation of GCSF. And actually, to, we, we, we show that you know, the rust you know, signaling part we play a critical role actually we found that you know either in it, it, it we found in activating a rust whether it's due to a mutant to mutations you know or it's due to actually to activation by amplification of tyrosine kinases Result, you know, in, in activation of the ETS2 transcription fat which result in increase you know GCSF you know transcription and, and actually um, this would uh, uh, predict, you know, that, you know, a MEK inhibitor, which is in, in the same pathway, would inhibit, you know, GCSF in, uh, release, you know, by, by tumor cells. And actually, this is exactly what happened, actually, in, 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 in uh, this happened to be a, a 41 tumor cell line. But we found about, you know, half of the human tumor cell line with an activated, you know, are regulating, you know, GCSF, you know. And so this is, uh, this, inhib this inhibitor called GDC0973 is already in clinical trial in patients with the melanoma, which became resistant to the Zelboraf, you know. And what is very interesting that, you know, in uh, certain tumors, for example, pancreatic cancer, which has been known for a long time, you know, to be associated with an activated and mutant RAS, you know. Actually, we tested, you know, the hypothesis, actually, that GCSF can be, actually, uh, can be upregulated. This is exactly what we found, you know. And this is, a, 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 in this animal experiment, actually, we give, we give a different combination, actually, we, uh, this is a control antibody, uh, 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 NTV Jeff alone has some effect, maybe 40 to 50 percent inhibition, and actually the, the, the MEK inhibitor is also some effect. But what is, uh, what is particularly intriguing that, you know, the combination of NTV Jeff and anti mech you know, substantially inhibit tumor growth. But what is perhaps even more striking is the fact that, you know, the anti-GCSF antibody in combined with anti vegf essentially phenocopied the, the MEK inhibitor plus an, an, an anti vegf even though a MEK inhibitor is expected to have a broad effect on cellular proliferation. But in this particular case, it seems that, you know, the ability to inhibit, you know, myeloid cells, you know, mobilization seems to be particularly prominent. And so it'll be very interesting to see if this finding can be translatable in the clinic. You know. And actually, I would like to show, actually, very briefly, actually, another really very intriguing piece of biology, which could be very relevant in, in, in the course of this study is kind of stumble in the IL-17 and TH-17 biology, which probably, has, is, I believe, is known to everyone. Is, uh, 
is a, uh, is a, is a chemokine which is produced mostly by the Th17 cells, which is a subset of helper T cells, which has been implicated you know, in autoimmunity, you know, in, and also has been associated with some tumors, actually, in a very, actually, uh, the, depending on the tumor type, you know, Th17 cells can be a negative or actually a positive prognostic factor, you know. Is a negative prognostic factor in colon, uh, and, and lung you know, cancer, but instead, you know, in, in, in ovarian cancer is the opposite, which essentially emphasizes how the, t the, the tumor environment could be very important. And actually, I mean, in the interest of time, I will just, you know, say that we're uh, looking still at our model of, of resistance versus, you know, since we found that, you know, in the resistant tumor of the chemokine, which is most, you know, strongly uh, upregulated, most strongly elevating the medium, this is using some, you know, uh, multiplex assay, was actually uh, IL-17. And we found actually, um, Using a genetic model, actually, uh, IL-17 receptor knockout mice, actually, IL-17 was critical in this model for mobilization of, you know, myeloid cells, you know. Actually, I should, uh, like, you know, CD11BGR1 cells, actually, it's been known for, for a long time, you know, the TH17 cells result in accumulation of neutrophils, you know. And the fact is that IL-17 is able to in induce expression of GCSF, you know, by, by, by stromal fibroblasts. So, so in the IL-17 receptor knockout, there is a dramatic reduction in myeloid cells, both in the peripheral blood as well as in, in, in the tumor. And, and actually, this is a, probably the crucial experiment to show that, you know, this is an orthotopic, you know, model of lung, you know, cancer. Show that, you know, an antibody actually to IL-17 or to anti-VEGF actually reduce tumor growth. But there is a, certainly more than additive effect when you, you combine the two. And actually, uh, and what is also very important, because once again, uh, uh, it's very clear that, you know, the, uh, the biology in the mouse in some, in some respect it can be different for humans. So it was very critical to verify that uh, uh, something like that is, is true even in humans. This is a section from colon cancer patients, actually. Uh, and we, we, we're able to show that, you know, the tumor infiltrate, you know, TH17 cells, you know, strongly correlated with the presence of, you know, neutrophils which express actually this uh, pro-angiogenic, you know, BV8, you know, protein, which is able to also to confer resistance to anti-VEGF. So, so, and, and so actually, uh, in a very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, perhaps a reductionist way, we can say that, you know, IL-17 can play a role, actually, in, uh, in, in tumorigenesis by multiple ways, actually, in tumor angiogenesis in multiple ways. It, it, can, be, it, it can be secreted by, by subset of hematological tumors, in which case it's produced by the tumor, actually activate, you know, uh, act on, on the stromal cells and, and result in increase of in GCSF, and actually, which result in the same, you know, cascade, which I, I, illust I illustrated you previously. But what is probably, I believe, probably more relevant is actually the uh, is uh, IL-17, which is produced actually by the TH17 cells, which actually can, can actually uh, uh, result in, in, in activation of this cascade. Another very important point I would like to make here, that which is uh, 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 which is go beyond IL-17 therapy, is the fact that we, as well as other, others, have been able to show that if you block, you know, VEGF with an antibody, actually, that results in, 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 in increase in, in infiltration of lymphocyte in the tumor, the two to five-fold increase, you know, in tumor infiltrating you know, a lymphocyte. It is certainly provides a substrate for testing the idea that block, you know, some immune checkpoint like, you know, and CTLA-4 or PDL one could have an additive effect, you know, on tumor growth. There are actually a number of trials combining Avastin with the anti-CTLA-4 on anti-PDL-1. And certainly time will tell where this works. You know. So I think in the interest of time, I would like to, um, uh, regrettably, is the, probably the most exciting application of anti-VEGF. I guess we're running, of time, uh, run, running out of time. I will say that actually uh, new vascular age-related you know, macular degeneration has been historically the leading cause of blindness in the elderly population. You actually, have, you know, this is a structure is a drusen, which is a, uh, which is a focal lifting you know, in, in the uh, uh, of RPE. And w once the drusen becomes vascularized, you know, can result, you know, in very devastating effect, you know, because you can can actually result in destruction of photoreceptor, you know. And even age-related macular degeneration is a very complex disease. Now it's very well known in about 50% you know, of the case there is a genetic component. There is, a, there is in, uh, in effect, you know, the complement, you know, cascade, there is an excessive inflammation. But irrespective of that, you know, it's very clear that, you know, 
uh, once that, you know, in, uh, 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 this Jerusalem became vascularized, this is what resulted blindness, you know. The, the neovascular, the wet AMD or neovascular AMD account for about, you know, 20% of the case of AMD. But it is responsible for 80% of the cases of blindness. And, and a number, and this is actually how the vision in a patient with AMD would look like, you know. There is actually, even though the peripheral vision is, is uh, relatively spare, but the central vision, which is so crucial for reading, writing, driving, instead it is uh, dramatically affected. You know, so the quality of life is, is, a very, is very poor, and actually. And um, years ago, there was the talk, you know, that you know, blocking of EEGF could have a beneficial effect even in, in wet AMD. At that time, actually, for, to, in, for many people, was the least interesting application. It was thought that this was perhaps a, a long, you know, shot, you know, with the very little, you know, rational. And so it was a very, very difficult, actually, to uh, overcome the inertia initiating a clinical trial. But these are the results with the one inhibitor, which is ranibizumab, which is uh, an antibody fragment, which actually derived from uh, bevacizumab. There is actually this uh, very striking, you know, actually, uh, benefit, you know, there was actually uh, uh, prevent, you know, in uh, 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 severe visual loss in over 90% of the patients. In about, you know, 35 to 40% of the patients, there is actually increase in visual acuity, which actually is one which drives this curve, you know, this increase in visual acuity, which is maintained, actually, for the duration of this trial. And actually, these are some concept of vascular biology, which we learned over the years, you know, how to account for this benefit, which seems to be actually great than the benefit that you see in cancer. Perhaps, you know, because in this disease you don't have, you know, the complexity of the genomic instability, you know. And so in, 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 in this condition of blocking of EEGF alone, of EEGF alone actually seems to inhibit in angiogenesis almost by 100%, which is very, very striking. Sometimes it, there is even a regression of blood vessels, you know. And uh, w w um, so the benefit is due, in, uh, first of all, to inhibition of the uh, growth of the CMV. Most is due to inhibition also vascular permeability, and, uh, and this can happen by multiple mechanisms, you know. On one hand, you know, the EGF you know, can directly induce vascular permeability. This was an activity which was initially discovered by Dvorak, you know. But also, perhaps even more important, in, in, uh, this increased permeability seems to be inherent, you know, in the growth of this uh, dysfunction of vessels, which are usually like, you know, perisite, you know, uh, they, uh, they, they, they develop a microaneurysm, so these pipes are really rotten. And blocking of EGF seems to result in a striking remodeling of this vessel. The vessels which are not, you know, covered by perisite, you know, will regress. And so this, uh, the, 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 this vessel will look, you know, normal. So in this case, you know, Rakesh, you know, Jane hypothesis will normalize this, so probably most applies to this condition, in my, in my opinion. And, uh, what is, what is very important is that, you know, uh, you don't need, you know, to give, you know, the, 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 this inhibitor on a monthly basis, but, you know, actually, uh, some recent studies have shown that actually, in, uh, after you achieve a stabilization of vision, you need only an infrequent inhibition of VEGF, maybe four to five, four to five injection per year. You can see this uh, multiple inhibitor, like including Bevacizum, Ranibizum, Aflibercept, you know, which result in a similar increase in, in visual acuity. It's something very similar has been seen also in another condition, which is retinal vein occlusion, actually, uh, in which case, you know, uh, PRN administration seems to be as effective as monthly administration. Even in this case, you know, for injection per year seems to be sufficient to substantially preserve, you know, visual acuity. And so I believe that this has been perhaps the most, you know, kind of inspiring, actually, result, you know, in this field, you know, the fact that you can actually uh, prevent, you know, visual loss, you know, in, in, in many patients. And such, you know, it, there, is, there is some recent studies that suggest, you know, whenever, you know, VEGF inhibitors are available, you know, v, uh, uh, um, if patients were treated with this inhibitor, wet AMD and probably other disease, it would be no longer a major cause of, you know, uh, uh, vision loss, you know, in, in, um, in, in, in the elderly population. And so I would like to conclude, you know, say what has been the impact of VEGF inhibitor in disease, you know, besides, of course, 
you know, uh, the point that VEGF has been a crucial regulator of, you know, uh, uh, that the measure impact in, ba in basic biology. It's been a benefit in several tumor types, and I believe that, you know, in, uh, VEGF inhibitor represented a standard of therapy in multiple tumors. Now, uh, a decade after their introduction, there'll be additional, uh, probably additional approval, as you can see, additional indication, like, you know, gastric cancer in the case of ram ramocirumab, you know, perhaps, you know, cervical cancer in, uh, with the bevacizumab, you know. But certainly, the more dram dramatic benefit has been seen in patients with intra intraocular and neovascular disease, such as wet AMD. But in, I, I would say that, you know, in spite of this, you know, uh, there is about a third of patients, you know, with wet AMD, which respond, you know, poorly to VEGF inhibitor, which, once again, one could lead suggesting you know, the possibility that there's some, you know, uh, mechanism of resistance. And actually, it's intriguing, you know, the very same mediator I was describing you in tumor, like inflammatory mediator, you can find almost exactly the same molecule in high fluid patients with this disease. And so the challenge would be identifying some biomarkers, you know, establish optimal treatment and combination, and, and, and last but not least, you know, elucidate some mechanism of resistance. Actually, I realize I, I went slightly over time. I apologize. Apologize for that. You know, I would like to conclude. You know, this talk. You know, actually thanking you for attention, and, and of course, acknowledging many colleagues and collaborators who have been with this uh, really an incredible contribution to this work, which had started, you know, almost you know three decades ago. Thank you so much.